Hello and welcome to the Abbott Hematology Hit Series today on the Art and Science of Hematology Morphology. I am Michelle Ashton of Labyrinth and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the Support tab found at the top right of the presentation window or report your problem by clicking on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located at the top right of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. Today, our presenter, Dan Pelling, will share his decade-long expertise in morphology. He will start with the art and science of cellular staining principles and its importance in the hematology laboratory. Then he will tie this together for a review of unique patient cases that will help listeners align automated hematology results, morphological findings, and clinical diagnosis. Dan is the site manager for blood sciences at St. Mary's Hospital, Paddington, which is part of Northwest London Pathology based in the UK. He has extensive training in the laboratory and has multiple degrees and holds a higher specialist diploma in hematology and is qualified in forensic medicine. In his spare time, he leads educational efforts in the hematology community. He teaches at both undergraduate and postgraduate levels, is the lead tutor for the English program stream of the Multilingual International Education Program, eHemat Image, and holds advisory positions in UK NEQAS, Institute for Biomedical Sciences, and the European Hematology Association. Here are today's learning objectives. Overview of the mechanics behind slide making and the importance that morphology brings to clinical diagnosis. Implementation of staining protocols and consideration factors for your laboratory. Troubleshooting stain quality and factors to potentially adjust. And case reviews of morphology accompanied with results from hematology. Here are the required disclosures and disclaimers for today's presentation. It is now my pleasure to welcome Dan. Dan, you may now begin your presentation. So thank you for the introduction. Medical laboratory services are evolving at a rapid pace, and one particular area where this is happening is the application of digital technology and artificial intelligence algorithms to the morphological classification of cells. However, there will always be a role for the trained and competent laboratory scientist sitting at a microscope reviewing a blood smear, because at the end of the day, we all know patients' results don't always fall into neat categories, and the experienced eye can often draw conclusions beyond the ability of technology. And that is why blood film morphology and blood film review will always form the cornerstone of hematological evaluation. It can help with further testing, such as cytogenetics, molecular genetics, fluorescent in situ hybridization testing, next gener generation sequence testing, cytochemistry, and, and so on. And with the development of tailored medicine, these ancillary tests play a very important role in diagnosis and decision making about healthcare pathways. So we can see that at the end of the day, there are some key points about why we review blood films. Key amongst all of these is that it should add value to the results coming from your automated platform. 
and that's a point we can see in the middle of the slide here. We want to confirm the presence or absence of flags and other abnormal results coming from those analyzers. And what is very important when we are confirming the presence or absence of those flags or abnormal results, we must review the film in conjunction with the patient's current status and clinical history. We can have all of that knowledge in our heads, but if we're not looking at a good quality smear, then we're not starting from a good place. We have to know that what we're looking at under the microscope is giving us the correct information. And for that, we need to know that we are looking at an evenly spread blood film with a correct area for cell evaluation and that we're actually looking at the correct film to start with because it is very easy sometimes to pick up a film, look at one set of results on the screen from a patient and be looking at blood film from another patient. So making sure that it's a well-made smear with clear labeling and distinguishing unique identifiers is paramount. One thing we can do by looking at a film to know if it is a good quality smear is looking at artifacts or the shape of the cells. For example, if the cells appeared all an elliptocytic shape, but they're all pointing with their long axes in the same direction, it suggests there's probably been a spreading artifact, and one would have to be cautious about drawing a conclusion of hereditary elliptocytosis, for example. So knowing we've got a good quality smear is the starting point. This is a diagram that we're all very familiar with. It's an image of how a blood smear is made, showing the three key steps. Placing the blood drop on the slide, drawing the spreader slide back into that blood drop and allowing the blood to wick or move along the spreader slide, and then advancing the spreader slide. Now, some automated platforms will do this. Uh, they're not just stainers, but they're slide makers and stainers and they may use a variation in either speed or angle of the spreader slide to take into account the viscosity of the blood. Of course, if we're making blood films manually, we have to adjust the angle ourselves. And this is where we're looking at the art and science of morphology. Because for many of us that have worked in laboratories for years, we know that learning how to make a good smear certainly is an art. Again, this next slide is a f diagram that we're all very familiar with. It shows the different types of smear qualities that we frequently see in the laboratories and some of the causes as well. But on the left-hand side of the screen, we can see an example of a well-made smear. The edges are parallel and it's quite long and advances around about a half or two-thirds of slide of the, the length of the slide. But we can see examples A to H on the right-hand side where the smear doesn't look very good. It's got a jagged edge where we might be using a chipped spreader. Lots of parallel lines moving up the slide where there's probably been hesitation as the spreader has been moved forward. Or a bit of a point to the slide where, for example, the spreader has been moved too quickly. Slides D and E show where we've probably not put enough blood on the slide to start with. A blood drop of usually 3 to 5 microliters is sufficient. Uh, or where we haven't allowed the blood to wick along the spreader slide enough. And we've got a very narrow slide up the middle. Slide F shows something that, that we see with lipemia or greasy slides. It's very important to make sure that our slides are clean. They're not dusty, they're not dirty, they're not greasy. Slide G shows an example where the spreader has been put unevenly onto the slide. And slide H, something that frequently happens, is an example of the type of smear we see when the blood drop has been allowed to dry slightly before the smear has been made. <coughs> 
it is important to learn how to make a smear well because it is very easy to fall foul of some of these abnormalities that we see. So we know that we've got a well-made smear. Then we have to decide, are we looking at the right part of the blood film? Once a slide is stained, we look at it and decide what part of the film to look at. There are parts of the film that are too thin to examine, parts that are too thick. We have the feathered edge or the far leading part of the feathered edge where cells can be distorted. And then we have this just right zone. One could almost call this the Goldilocks zone of the slide. If we look at a part of the slide where it's too thin, cells can often appear larger and they can lack the central pallor. This can often lead to misinterpretation of morphology. If we look at a part of the slide that is too thick, then the red cells are overlapping and we can't really examine the morphology correctly. But if we look at the far right of this slide, we can see the image that says just right, the Goldilocks zone. And that's where the red cells are ever so slightly touching or maybe ever so slightly overlapping but they're not distorting or obscuring the morphology and if we look at the next slide we can see that in slightly more detail and here we have on the left hand side of the screen an area of the blood film where the cells are ever so slightly touching maybe a small gap between the cells some cells are slightly overlapping, but we can see the individual morphology and we can see the central pallor in the cells. On the right-hand side of the screen is an area of a slide where it's too thick to examine, and we can see that the red cells are slightly overlapping and uh, obscuring the morphology a little bit. So we would want to move away from that part of the slide to an area where it's slightly thinner, an area where there's a good monolayer of cells. So we've made our blood smear. We know that it's a good quality blood smear. We know that we're looking in the right part of the slide to examine cell morphology, but we need to understand the stain. We need to know if the stain we're looking at is of good quality as well. And this is where understanding the Romanovsky stain really comes into its own. The Romanovsky stain is an overarching description of a number of stains that have been listed here on the slide. The Leishman stain, the Megrum Vold Giemser stain, the Giemser stain on its own, right Giemser or maybe modified right stain as well. There are a number of different types that can be purchased or made in-house that follow the Romanovsky principle. The Romanovsky principle uses two key components to a stain, Azure B and Eosin Y. Different manufacturers will have slightly different components to their stain, but those are the common factors that you will find in most Romanovsky stain that are purchased. The stain principle is based on this time differential uptake of components of the cell by the different components of the stain. What we need to understand is that this time dependent differential uptake of stains is influenced by local pH, by temperature, and by the ionic charge in the staining environment. So staining to us in the hematology lab is usually quite straightforward, but when we look actually into the processes that are going on, there are a number of components we need to be aware of to ensure that we're looking at a good quality stain. A poor quality stain can be very misleading, and at worst, it can lead to a misdiagnosis. So looking at the stain components, let's have a look at Azure B. Azure B is the basic component of the stain that binds to the acidic proteins in the cell nucleus and the cytoplasm. It is responsible for this polychrome, this 
this multitude of colors that we see in our final slide. And here is the structure of it. We don't really need to understand in depth the structure, but it's nice to actually see it here so we can understand a little bit about how some of the Azure B components interact with the ESNY components. Uh, this Azure B is what gives us some of our nice blue colors, and we can see from the next slide how that appears. So here we have some images of some immature cells showing some vivid blue cytoplasm and some nice purple and mauve nuclei. And each cell in these images shows some nice clear nucleoli within the nucleus. So these blue and purples are derived from the Azure B component of the stain. Here we have another example of a lymphocyte, a more mature cell that has its dark purple nucleus and a small amount of blue cytoplasm around the outside. This distinction between the purple and the blue is what allows us to say, yep, the stain is working well. Let's have a look at the other main components of the Romanovsky stains, the ESNY. And here we can see the basic chemical structure. When the Azure components and the Eosin components combine, we actually see compounds called Azure Eosinates or Azure Eosin substrates. The Eosin Y is the acidic component of the stain that binds to the basic cellular components, hemoglobin molecules and certain cytoplasmic granules. And we can see in the next slide how this appears. One of the cells where this is most obvious is the eosinophil. And we can see from the three images here the vivid orange of the eosinophil granules in the cytoplasm. In fact, they're not so much granules as more as globules. They appear like refractile little glass beads. When those shine orange, then we know we've got a good stain working at the right pH. So having looked at a couple of examples of how the stain appears in the cells, here's a table that actually shows it in more depth. The different components of the cell, the chromatin, the nucleus, perinucleoma chromatin, and the different granules, how they appear with a good quality stain. Remembering that the staining quality may vary from batch to batch, and we will be looking at this a little bit later. But it's not just about the white cells and the nuclei and the chromatin. It's also about other cellular inclusions, such as our rods or how jolly bodies or doly bodies. They have specific colors as well that we need to be able to recognize in order to be able to classify them. So although local procedures will vary slightly, the majority of Romanovsky staining processes follow a very simple procedure in which the slides are first prepared and allowed to dry at room temperature. We do know that if you dry a slide with excess heat, it can affect cell morphology. However, gently blowing obliquely across a slide while holding the slide on maybe the ball of your hand, a little bit of heat comes up from inside the slide and you can dry the slide a little bit more quickly, which does help preserve morphology. Slides are then usually fixed, they're stained, they're rinsed in buffer, and what is important is that step number four, that rinsing in buffer, because it's when the buffer is applied to the slide that the ionic change occurs, which allows the components of the stain to react and the color to become vivid. So here's an example of some red cells. Saying in the last slide that the pH is very important is exemplified with this slide we're looking at now. On the left-hand side of the screen, we can see some nice orange, salmon pink red cells. They've got good central pallor. They're slightly touching, ever so slightly overlapping, so we know we're looking at nicely stained slides 
in the right part of the film. And that color, that orange or salmon pink, is because the pH is about 6.8, which is what we should be staining our peripheral films at. The image on the right-hand side shows red cells that have been stained in a slightly more alkaline buffer. That's approximately 7.2. Staining red cells at 7.2 is something that really we like to do more with malaria films because malaria thin films, when stained at 7.2, allow us to see some of the internal structures more clearly for the parasites and some of the intracellular inclusions as well, such as Schiffner's dots in Plasmodium vivax or Maurer's clefts in Plasmodium falciparum. But we can see this grey-green appearance of the red cells on the right-hand side tell us that the buffer is too alkaline. And if we see that, we know that we can go back and remake our buffer and restain our slide. So that's a very good point to note for troubleshooting. This slide shows neutrophil staining. So we can see a single neutrophil in the image and we can see that the cytoplasm has nice discrete granules. Neutrophil granules are a very sensitive indicator of how well your stain is performing. The staining times, the staining temperature, and the buffer pH. Here we can see an eosinophil that is nicely stained with a good purple nucleus three lobes that we can see and the vivid orange granules in the cytoplasm. That combination of colors tells us that the eosinosin Y component of the stain is working well. And here we see a basophil. The basophils take up preferentially the azure B component into their granules and that gives the granules this dark, intense appearance. It is useful to note that in basophils, commonly, the granules overlie the nucleus, and indeed they can often obscure it, whereas we don't see this nuclear obscuring in other granular sites. If we understand those points, how the neutrophil granules stain, how the eosinophil and basophil granules stain, then we can say that we're looking at a good quality smear with a good quality stain. But let's take a step back and think about how we would get to that point. Let's say we're implementing a new staining system. What would be the points we would have to consider? Well, if we're putting a new process into place in the laboratory, there are a number of key things to think about. Um, that is, how good is the system that you're looking at going to be for your service? Do you actually need automated staining or do you need manual staining? This might be something that's stipulated in a managed service contract. One has to think about the cost, not just of the appliance, but of the reagents, the actual supply chain for the reagents, how easy it is to use and maintain the piece of equipment and how easy it is to train staff on the equipment. But it is also important to say, how does this new process, piece of equipment, whatever it is you're putting in place, compares with previous or existing systems? This is all about compatibility and comparability. And it is important to think about future-proofing anything that you put in place as well because of the advance of digital technology and the artificial intelligence that we spoke about right at the beginning. When comparing your stain quality from batch to batch or when introducing a new system, it is often very useful to have a very simple checklist of staining components that you want to look at. And here is a small list of important points that you would want to examine on a stain smear to make sure that the stain and the process is working well. You'd want to look at the red cells, the white cells, and the platelets to make sure that you've covered all lineages and that all aspects of those cells are staining well.
It's important to be able to troubleshoot pore staining when we look at our slides. And in order to do that, we can look at the color again. And here are some examples of where the buffer might be too acidic, or the buffer might be too alkaline, or the washing stages may be too long or too short, or the components of the stain that you're using may be too low. And we can see the color differences here under those two scenarios with the cells appearing too red on the left hand side and the cells looking that gray green color, something that we touched on in one of the earlier slides. Now this slide shows something that we've all come across from time to time when we look at a blood film and it looks very pale and washed out. The nuclear appear, appears indistinct. Red cells look sort of brown or maybe slightly yellow instead of the orange or the salmon pink. And this can usually be due to insufficient staining time or indeed the film's not being fixed for long enough or maybe even overwashing or using an old stain that's lost its potency. Very important that we know when our stains were opened and what their expiry dates are so we don't overuse the stains. And as I mentioned earlier in one of the slides, the neutrophil granules are very important. They are a really good indicator of how well your stain is working. The neutrophil granules stain by a process of taking up Azure B and then Eosin Y afterward in a time-dependent differential manner. They are very sensitive to pH. And we know that if we can't see the neutrophil granules very well, then we probably have got insufficient staining time, insufficient buffering time, or an old overused stain. Now, it's often we see high, heavy dark staining granules in a film in the neutrophils. It is important to be able to distinguish overstaining from genuine toxic granulation. So one would often look for other signs of toxic uh, changes in neutrophils, such as vacuolation, in order to determine whether or not it is a genuine appearance to the granules. The next few slides show some examples of these beautiful color changes that we see from these Romanovsky stains. And this is what is appealing to so many people who look at blood films, we, we see this range of colors, these blues, the pinks, the purples, and it's very appealing. And I've often thought some slides would be, make very good wallpaper or duvet covers. What we're looking at here is a range of cells going through maturation stages. In the image on the left hand side, we can see a myeloblast in the middle with its vivid blue cytoplasm and its nice purple nucleus. And surrounding that cell, we see a range of mature neutrophils with different degrees of chromatin condensation. We can see the purples and the mauves coming out very well, being very distinct from the neutrophil granulation. Just below the myeloblast in that left-hand image, we can see a promyelocyte with its eccentric nucleus, its lower nucleoside to plasmic ratio, and the hint of nucleoli in the nucleus, and the granulation in the cytoplasm. Along with the nice orange salmon pink color of the red cells, we can say this is a really good example of good quality staining. And if we move to the right hand image, not only can we see the difference in maturation of the chromatin of the neutrophils, we can also see an eosinophil myelocyte in the middle of the screen, and that shows its nice, vivid orange granules. A cell that we don't often see. Looking at this next side, we can see a range of neutrophil maturation with the more open chromatin in the slightly less mature neutrophils and the more condensed chromatin in the slightly more mature neutrophils. We can also see an eosinophil at the top of the left-hand image. Looking at the right-hand image, 
Well, the largest cell there is the promyelocytes with its eccentric nucleus, its nucleolated nucleus, the granules in the blue cytoplasm, and we can also see a nice clear area in the cytoplasm of that promyelocyte, which is the Golgi zone. Very important feature for determining whether or not a cell is a promyelocyte or not. But as we move around that film, we can see the myelocyte, the metamyelocyte, and the more mature neutrophil with its more deep purple condensed chromatin in the nucleus. A really nice slide that exemplifies the range of colours that we see. We're now going to move on to some case reviews. Now, these case reviews aren't for diagnostic purposes. They're really to exemplify, once again, the colours and the art of morphology and how things link together. But moving on to case one. This was a chronic myelomonocytic leukaemia that was beginning to transform into an acute myelomonocytic leukaemia. And we can see a summary of the abnormal results there. The abnormal results have been highlighted in bold and red. We can see this had a very high white count, a low hemoglobin, a low platelet count, and the analyzer produced a high immature granulocyte count of 11.6. What did that actually look like on the scatter plots coming off the analyzer? Because the scatter plots on the analyzer also provide us with this additional arm of the art of morphology, being able to look at scatter plots and say, what is this likely to show us on the blood film? What are we going to be looking for? What are we going to comment on that's going to add value to these results? And here we can see some red cell plots in red, and we can see some platelet scatter plots in yellow. This next slide shows the white scale cell scatter plots. Neutrophils are represented in yellow, monocytes, or the larger cell population, in purple, and the lymphocytes in blue. Now, that really doesn't tell us that much from those scatter plots. However, when we look at the film, this is what we see. This very high white count, 237, Looking closely at both images, we can see an absence of platelets, and we can see these large cells. If we go back to the results, the monocytes here were counted as 187, extremely high because it would be unusual to see a monocyte count greater than one. But we can see a lot of these cells have got open, lacy, purple chromatin. They've got a moderate to a high nucleocytoplasmic ratio. And what is quite nice, in the middle of the image on the right-hand side, we can actually see a mitotic figure where the chromosomes have stained up with the azure B component. They appear nice and purple and are beginning to separate out towards the poles of the cell. The second case study, a CML, a chronic myelogenous leukemia, or chronic myeloid leukemia. Again, we can see a very abnormal white count, very high, 74.8. We can see a raised neutrophil count, a raised monocyte count, a raised eosinophil count, and a raised immature granulocyte count. We can also see a slightly raised platelet count, and in fact, this was a case that was picked up almost purely by the raised platelet counts, although obviously the white cells are abnormal. Looking at the red cell plot, it's fairly unremarkable. Looking at the white cell plots, the scatter plots, we can see that the yellow, the neutrophil population, is larger than we would expect in a normal healthy patient. It's more spread out, more diffuse. And this tells us that there's something abnormal on this film, and combined with that raised immature granulocyte count, a film review was ordered. And this is what we saw, a CML with thrombocytosis. In the middle of the film, we can see a large myeloblast, 
The overall size of the cell is large. The nucleocytoplasmic ratio is moderate to high. It has a very distinct large nucleolus in the nucleus. And we can see that surrounded by the slightly darker perinucleolar chromatin and the blue cytoplasm. The nucleus also has a slightly oval sort of rectangular shape to it. And the nucleus seems to go right up to the edge of the cell as well. All features which, when looked at together, tell you that this is a myeloblast. The rest of this image shows myeloid cells at different states of maturation. We can see mature neutrophils that do appear a little bit abnormal. And we can see a metamyelocyte, probably late myelocyte, early metamyelocyte, at the bottom of the film in the middle. And we can see some granulated basophils as well with their deep, intense blue granules. The range of purples and the pinks and the blues that we see here are a really good example again of good quality stains. Let's move on to case study three. This was a thrombotic thrombocytopenia purpura, a condition that has to be acted on quickly, something that we really are expected to be able to recognize and act on very quickly in the laboratory by informing the clinicians. And we do this generally through the blood films by noticing key features. And we'll have a look at those in a minute. The full blood count results were a little bit unremarkable, nothing too abnormal, although there are some abnormalities there, until we get to the platelet count. And we see the platelet count is 53 so moderately reduced. It was this unexpected low platelet count that actually triggered the film review in this case. This was the scatter plot. The red cell scatter plot was much more revealing in this case than it was in the earlier cases. We can see that the red cells highlighted by the red part of the scatter plots an abnormal shape. On the left hand side of the screen we can see two red cell plots, one above each other. If we look at the lower one we can see there seems to be this uh, a number of red cells actually falling down from the main population of red cells. And if we look in the top right hand scatter plot we can see that the population is almost split between two discrete populations one that extends right up to the top of the map and this bottom central population of much smaller red cells. Well, what can these be? Well, bear that in mind. We look at the white cell scatter plot. We have some fairly normal, maybe slightly enlarged populations of cells, but they're still nice and discreet and not particularly overlapping. So it is the red cells here that we want to look at. And we know from all of our experiences that the red cell changes that we see on films can be some of the most dramatic sometimes. This is what the film looked like. We have a lower power image on the left hand side and a higher power image on the right hand side. Looking at the film immediately highlighted the presence of a large number of red cell fragments. Some of the more traditional triangular sites that we see, and sometimes we see helmet cells, the cells with the two horns, the keratocytes, um, part of um, the fragmentation process. If we look at the right hand image, we can see this in slightly better view. We can see where cells appear to have been broken up. But as the red cells have been circulating, they've been destroyed by fibrin that's being deposited in the vasculature. This is what causes the fragmentation. This particular patient had 40% fragments, a very, very high count that had to be telephoned through and acted on immediately. The patient did survive. 
Moving on to our final case study, case study four. This was a case study for an unusual thalassemia patient. And here we can see that the white cells really are quite unremarkable and the differential is unremarkable. The red cell parameters are what drew our attention to this case. A low, low mean cell volume, 62.9, and a very low mean cell hemoglobin, 18.1. And then we looked at the platelet count, 1,826. Wow, okay, so that's quite high. Definitely warrants a blood film review. What are we going to see? So we looked at the red cell scatter plots, quite abnormal. We actually see the red of the red cells and the yellow of the platelets beginning to merge here. There's overlap. And this tells us that actually maybe the results coming off the analyzer might not be accurate. We look at the top right-hand scatter plot for the volume of red cells versus their hemoglobin concentration, and we see that the population is actually shifted to the lower part of the, the map and slightly towards the left-hand side as well. So clearly there was something very abnormal going on with the red cells here. And when we looked at the film, this is what we saw. So, again, a truly remarkable film. Um, not very good for the patient, but beautiful from a hematological and morphological point of view. Extreme poikilocytosis, showing oval cells, elliptoid cells, and very long and parallel edged pencil cells, Teardrop cells where they appear to be budding, we saw microspherocytes, we saw microcytes of all different types and descriptions. So what was going on to produce such extreme morphological change? Well, this actually was a T. Saudi mutation. Now, many people might not have heard of that. But this is uh, an alpha chain mutation, and it's not uh, a deletion. It's part of uh, a change in the alpha chains that causes the alpha chains to be extended. And it is known to cause a much more extreme imbalance between the beta chains and the alpha chains of hemoglobin, leading to this thalassemic presentation. What was so good about this film is the staining was good and we saw such a nice appearance of the red cells that we were able to link that morphology with the genetic mutation and that wrapped up the scientific aspect of hematology and the artistic aspect of morphology and pulled the whole picture together and told us that yes, in fact, hematology is both an art and a science so these images and the staining and the colour distinctions that we've seen really bring home to us that morphology is not just a science, it's not just recognising how different cell shapes apply to different disease states, how different cell stages of maturation apply to different disease states. It shows us that we need to understand how our stain is working and that when we look at these colours we can tell in part what's going on with a patient and we can make comments on a blood film, add value, and hopefully advance the patient's healthcare pathway. And that, to me, is the art and science of morphology. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. We appreciate your time today and all the valuable information you have presented for our audience. We will now go ahead and start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. As a reminder for our audience, if you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen, and we'll answer as many questions as we have time for. All right, Dan, let's go ahead and start with your first question. First question says, looking at the last case, Quite remarkable red cell morphology there, but perhaps you decided to not reveal the true platelet count to give the listeners time to think what it might be. Can you now reveal what the true platelet count actually was? 
So, um, yes, hello. I, I can reveal what the true platelet count was, but uh, just to say that these are questions that sometimes crop up in haematology quizzes, what's the true platelet count in the context of bizarre red cell morphology because of that interference. And what we found in this case was the true platelet count was 171, not 1,826. So a, a, a huge difference in the platelet count. Great, thank you so much. Okay, let's go ahead and move on to our next question. What is the exact angle required to make a good smear? Well, of course, the exact angle to make a good smear does depend upon the hematocrit or the packed cell volume of the, the blood that you're using to make the smear. If you have a normal healthy patient whose hematocrit or PCV is between about 0 0.4 and 0 0.45 or between 40 to 45 percent, then it's usually about 30 degrees, the angle that the spreader makes with the slide. If the patient's hematocrit is slightly lower, so they're more anemic, then one would want to increase that angle and hold the spreader slide slightly more upright, maybe at 40, 45 degrees. That means that you're not pushing the blood all the way to the end of the slide. If the patient's hematocrit is slightly higher, maybe 0 0.5, 0 0.55, or 55 to 60%, then you would want to decrease the angle and hold the spreader slide a little bit lower down maybe at about 20 degrees or so, and that allows that thicker blood to make a, a proper, decent length slide. Now, how long would you say a slide can stay unstained before it is too compromised to stain? Again, that really depends on the environment that you're keeping that unstained slide in. Are you keeping them fixed but unstained, or smeared and not fixed and not stained? <clears throat> I would say that the smaller, smallest period of time possible, really. But if you're going to try and store unstained films, then I would try to fix them at least first. And then, certainly in, in my experience, we've kept unstained slides up to about three to six months sometimes, and the morphology has been perfectly acceptable when we've gone back to stain them. If they're unfixed, then yes, I probably wouldn't keep them that long, probably up to about three months. But really, it does depend upon the environment. I would try to keep them away from light and away from any sources of dust or other contamination. Great, thank you. Okay, this next user would like to know what usually causes pale pink stains? If you have a pale pink stain, then um, you can be looking at insufficient buffering time. So you might want to increase the amount of, of time that the slide is exposed to buffer in that final step of the Romanovsky stain, your staining principles. It could also be that you have a, a slightly older stain. So if you have a low throughput of slides in your particular laboratory, then you may not use up your stain as quickly as other labs that have a higher throughput, which means your stain is open and exposed to the air for a little bit longer, which means it can lose some of its potency as some of those components oxidize. E even in supposedly sealed systems, this can happen. So I would first look at your expiry time, how long the stain has been open and in use, and maybe renew the stain, open a new batch, for example, or maybe slightly increase your buffering time. Because remember, it's when that buffer is added in the final, few, final stage of, of the staining process that the color and the reactions are taken to their final steps. Now, what can I do if I discover a low count during differential? If one discovers a low count during a differential, well, 
when we perform, um, if we're talking about manual differentials, usually when we perform a manual differential, one would do that on 100 cells, 100 white cell count. If the count is particularly low, um, usually less than about 1 or less than about 0.5, one can reduce the number of cells that you're counting to maybe 50 or, or even 25 sometimes, and then multiply up by a factor of four if you're counting 25 cells, or two if you're counting 50 cells, to get your final percentage for your diff manual differential. That, that sometimes is easier said than done, what one can do to avoid statistical bias for particularly low counts is make descriptive comments on the type of white cells that you have seen. For example, post bone marrow transplant patients may have extremely low white counts, 0 0.1, 0 0.2. Performing a differential on those could be misleading sometimes. What could be more useful to the clinicians is describing the types of cells you've seen scanty, a few moderate numbers of neutrophils or lymphocytes, for example, and whether or not their morphology is normal or abnormal. Thank you, Dan. All right, let's go ahead and move on to our next question. When preparing the smear, how long should the slide be allowed to air dry? And does long hours of drying, for example, overnight, have an effect on the morphology of cells? Okay, so to answer the second part of that question first, yes, prolonged drying overnight can alter the morphology of the red cells. The cells can begin to show signs of crenation or shrinkage, um, even when they have been spread but not fixed. Really, the ideal approach to drying and then beginning to fix and stain your slides means that that first step of drying should, should really be done as quickly as possible, but not in a forced way. As we said in the presentation, applying excessive heat can really distort cell morphology. But gentle heat, allowing the slides maybe to dry over two to three minutes, is usually acceptable and shows no loss of morphology. Usually the good morphology is preserved. Great, thank you. Okay, this next one's a really great, great question. As technology advances over the years to come, Morphology, as mentioned, will always be a cornerstone of hematology. Where do you see morphology in the next 10 years? And do you think various elements will entirely become automated or some aspects will have to remain manual? Okay, where are we going to go over the next few years? Well, uh, it's, that's a, a very interesting, a great question because things are changing so rapidly. We have a number of platforms out there that will classify cells um, for us and really increase the rate with which we can review films, and it will reduce the number of films that we have to look at manually down the microscope. Some people have often questioned, does that mean we're going to lose that skill? I don't think we will. I think it will allow us to add another skill, the, for want of a better phrase, the electronic morphology. We will have to develop skills and get our eye in and, and calibrate our eyes for uh, looking at these, all these images that are produced and deciding whether or not the cells have been classified correctly. So we still do need people with that knowledge and experience and training to be able to look at the results coming from these automated systems to say whether or not the cells have been classified correctly. There are uh, a number of, of uh, papers that have been written to show that in cases of extreme abnormality, uh, cells are very difficult, uh, certain automated platforms find cells very difficult to classify. 
And that is when we have to take our films and look at them under the microscope and apply that subjectivity in order to say what's actually going on, what are we looking at, what are the morphological features. So looking down a microscope will always be a required skill. How much we look down the microscope, well, that may change. And even though it may reduce, we may find ourselves looking at more digital images on big screens, but still applying our knowledge. Thank you, Dan. Okay, your next question. Do you know of a way to preserve stained smears for a long time? Well, certainly in my laboratory, we have stained smears that we have filed going back 30 years and more. We, as a matter of course, will always file away our peripheral blood smears with our bone marrow smears. And there's a requirement for us to keep those bone marrow smears for, for a minimum of 30 years. We do store them upright in trays in the dark. And it's nothing more complicated than that. And we go back to them frequently and we find that there's no loss of color and they look absolutely fine. We, we have a what we call in my laboratory the Green Dot Collection, which goes back um, as a teaching set over 35 years. And some of those films, um, having been stored in the dark, um, just in normal ambient temperature in the laboratory, um, have got as good a morphology as the day that they were spread. Thank you. It looks like we have time for a few more questions. So this one's interesting. I've noticed a different staining adult versus newborn slides. The red cells especially, should slides from neonates be stained differently? I, that's a very, that's quite a difficult question to, to answer really, because at the end of the day, one has to follow one's local protocols that have been agreed by laboratory staff, supervisors, and the clinical teams using that service. Um, that's really the disclaimer answer to that question. Uh, but we, we have a large adult population. We have a very large neonatal and pediatric population. And yes, we do sometimes see difference in staining. And that's sometimes due to the hematocrits being slightly different and a slightly thinner film will appear slightly paler and a slightly thicker film, say a packed film from a neonate with a very high hemoglobin, um, for example, may have a more vivid color. So the red cells may, may appear more red. Um, the white cells may appear more, uh, more pale. Um, so there's a combination of colors. Of course, the amount of protein in the plasma um, that obviously gets mixed with the whole blood when you're making the slide can affect the way the slides look both macroscopically and microscopically as well. Macroscopically, they will appear slightly more blue with a higher protein concentration. Microscopically, you might see a, a more sort of yellow-blue appearance to the background between the cells. But generally, if you've got a good quality stain that you are quality controlling every day against criteria such as those shown in one of the slides, there should be no need to use a different approach to staining uh, pediatric neonatal films versus adult films. Okay, Dan, let's go ahead and wrap up with this last question. How did you validate your current staining? Our current staining, well, 90% of our slides, we use an automated slide maker and stainer. We have a secondary method, which is a semi-automated method where we make the slides by hand, but then put them through um, and they get stay, fixed and stained uh, by an automated method. We compared the two. We knew that uh, on our new system, we had to have certain criteria set up 
So we used a grade of one to five and compared the stain quality from our new system versus the stain quality from our existing system, with one being non-comparable and very poor and five being very comparable and excellent staining against criteria such as color of the red cells, color of the white cells, color of the nuclei, appearance of granules, and appearance of cytoplasm. Uh, we also looked at other factors such as the presence or absence of water artifacts and the distribution of cells. Uh, were there gaps left between the cells? Was the smearing quality acceptable, not just the staining quality? We looked at a number of normal slides, 20 slides, and we looked at a number of abnormalities including those uh, conditions that present with blasts and promyelocytes and, and other white cells and red cells at different stages of maturation. So really, we sat down and we thought, what do we want this new system to show us? And to what degree? Of course, it is subjective when you grade those. So we made sure that we had at least two or three people looking at these slides and that there was consensus when scoring on this system of one to five. That, that's all that we could do, but we found that it worked for us. Thank you, Dan, and thank you to our audience for their questions. That concludes our live Q&A session. Now, Dan, do you have any final comments for our audience before we go today? I I think really, yes, morphology is an art and it's a science. We have to know what we're looking at, but we have to know why things appear the way they do when we're talking about morphology. And it's not something that someone can be trained and fully competent in, in a case of just a few weeks or months. We've been looking at uh, films for decades and decades and every day we might see something new and something that we have to go and look up and something that surprises us. So it's always an ongoing process and as far as morphology is concerned, one is never too old to learn. Thank you again, Dan, for your time today and your important and informative presentation. We would also like to thank Labberts and our sponsor, Abbott, for underwriting today's educational webcast. And before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their questions. As a reminder, any questions that we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by our speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand and Labroots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, take care. Goodbye.